Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to a Grand Rounds at uh, GNI. So uh, this morning is a, a particularly uh, uh, honor for me to uh, introduce our, our speaker, uh, Dr. Aditya Pandey, uh, who's the Julian T. Hoff Professor and Chair of Neurosurgery at the University of Michigan. He's also the Surgical Director of the Comprehensive Stroke Program at the University of Michigan. Uh, he's widely published internationally. Uh, he uh, speaks globally, is well known in the vascular and actual neurosurgery community. He's the associate editor of, of Stroke, Interventional Neurology, numerous NIH grants going way back. Uh, I think he started when he was a Howard Hughes uh, fellow back uh, uh, in an undergraduate actually. Um, Dr. Pandey uh, received his MD degree from Case Western University. Uh, and then we were fortunate enough, uh, Thomas Jefferson, to land him as a resident and uh, tricked him into staying on as a fellowship. Uh, he was one of the first few dual trained open and endovascular neurosurgeons. <clears throat> and uh, honestly can tell you was one, uh, if not the uh, best resident that I've ever worked with. Um, and uh, I think everybody else uh, would absolutely say the same. And it's no surprise to anyone that uh, he uh, is now the chair at the University of Michigan. Um, and for those of you that uh, ever think that the good guy doesn't win, Dr. Pandy is the epitome of the good guy winning. So this morning, he's going to be talking about innovations in ICH management. Um, and uh, the comprehensive uh, uh, nature of that um, in today's uh, modern neurosurgery practice. And with that, uh, Dr. Pandey, I'll hand over to you. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Vez. Uh, you know, I've, uh, I've known Dr. Vez as a, uh, someone who's mentored me, someone who's been a, a great friend uh, and an outstanding colleague over the years. So. Uh, you know, every so often in this forum, I want to be able to say Dr. Vez, but it might slip out Errol uh, once in a while. So uh, I'm going to start uh, putting forth my presentation here from the beginning. Please let me know what you see uh, on on the screen. Does You're that good. look okay? Yep. Okay. Perfect. Great. Uh, so uh, tremendous honor to be able to, you know, join everybody. Uh, I think all of us wish that we could do this uh, in person, uh, but uh, it's good to be able to uh, be there virtually and to be able to talk about ICH management. You know, the first part of the talk uh, is going to have the current state and, and some of the trials and uh, evidence that we have in managing ICH. And I think the second part of the talk uh, will be a little more exciting because it touches upon innovations and and potentially what could happen in the next few years, uh, both in ICH management as well as in neurosurgical procedures uh, with uh, hopefully some of the ultrasound-based technologies uh, that I'll talk about. With respect to disclosures, you know, I, I have the privilege of working with an outstanding group of neurosurgical colleagues here at the University of Michigan. And you see some of them. Uh, pictured uh, here. Uh, in terms of, uh, you know, financial interest, uh, I have an intellectual property uh, in the histotripsy ultrasound-based therapy uh, within the brain arena, and that is licensed to Histosonics, a startup uh, a company. Uh, none of this uh, is within the clinical space uh, at, at this time. So, you know, the other disclosure I would tell you is I grew up in Ohio and I grew up, you know, 30 miles uh, from from the Ohio Stadium. And uh, uh, for, what was it, 15 to 18 years, uh, that's what, uh, you know, I breathed Ohio State football. And there was such a dislike uh, for the state up north where I reside now, you know, the state of Michigan. And I never thought I would work here. Uh, I always had immense amount of, uh, uh, of respect uh, you know, for the University of Michigan. But when the opportunity came, uh, it, you know, it, it was tremendous. And it's the culture of the place that has kept me here uh, for over 13 years now. I would tell you it's an experiment in progress. Uh, you know, 
it took me a good 10 years to be able to stop the disliking of the football team here. Uh, now I'm at a point where it's a neutral, you know, uh, feeling. And with that, you know, said, uh, congratulations to all of you who are uh, Eagles fans. Uh, uh, I'm an Eagles fan vicariously because I lived in Philly for seven years. Uh, but uh, hopefully a Super Bowl a championship is is on the way. So, you know, what's the GNI connection? There's so many connections with the, you know, the outstanding group of of GNI, uh, and and these are uh, friends, their mentors, their colleagues, and uh, I've learned, uh, you know, tremendously uh, from them. Uh, so, you know, let me just start out, and and you now we could put a whole talk together about you know, the, the nature of uh, GNI uh, faculty uh, and their national reputation and, and how they're innovating the field. But I wanted to be able to focus on three individuals uh, that uh, I've interacted with over years. Uh, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Benning, uh, uh, who's, you know, her grit and, uh, and enjoyment and ability to be able to take uh, care of patients uh, is second to none. Uh, uh, she's an outstanding colleague and so highly regarded uh, in our in our discipline. Uh, Dr. You know Ken Liebman and uh, Dr. Liebman, I've learned a lot from from him. Uh, he really, really, you know, the nuances and the technical skill sets uh, of managing complex cerebrovascular patients. Uh, you know, I still remember the days, and and I'm still. Uh, alarmed at how good his hair looks. I haven't seen it lately, but his ability, the wellness, uh, the, you know, e exercising on a daily basis, those exercise routines, I wish I could do uh, one day. And, uh, you know, uh, then Dr. Vez and, um, uh, you know, Errol's been uh, a friend and a colleague for, for so many years. I don't think, uh, you know, it's impossible to be able to predict what would have or could have uh, happened. But I would say, you know, it may have been very difficult for me to finish residency without uh, Errol's mentorship. Uh, you know, uh, the whole concept of, of being a neurosurgeon and that, so he's been involved in many, many aspects, whether it's, uh, you know, as a friend, uh, social support, uh, guiding, mentorship, teaching technical skill set, supporting, pushing. Uh, so, you know, the true type of mentor uh, that you want in life. Uh, so, you know, many, many thanks and uh, uh, really, really uh, glad uh, that we have a chance to be able to uh, further forge this collaboration. What are the topics of discussion? Uh, you know, the, the lessons learned, uh, I learned a lot uh, during training and you learn a lot from colleagues. Uh, you probably learn more outside of the operating room than you do in the OR. Uh, in the OR, you can learn from anybody. Outside the OR, you learn the specifics of how people are building teams, how they lead, how they build, how they innovate. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that and how I have been able to incorporate that in my own career. Uh, and then what's the current state of interest cerebral hemorrhage? I promise you, I will. You know, I will have to give some data and trials and studies, and we'll try to keep it, uh, you know, uh, moving. And then, I think the most exciting part: what's the future? Uh, where are we headed? Uh, can minimally, minimally invasive head to an an arena uh, that is incisionless? Uh, you know, forget about putting holes, making incisions. Can we actually do portions of neurosurgery in real time? Uh, put a knife within the brain uh, without ever touching the brain. Uh, so, you know, starting out with lessons learned, you know, I, I think the way I built my practice, uh, the way I collaborate uh, in the clinical arena uh, to be able to grow our program, uh, to be able to do collaborative science are things that I saw. And, and I utilize that as a foundation uh, to be able to move forward and see what we could do within this arena. Uh, it's interesting, uh, what may be commonplace for one place may be extremely innovative for another place because it hasn't been done. And so, you know, the, the simplicity of 
uh, gathering together uh, with with a, a group of clinicians who are interested in stroke care, and and subsequently being able to push ahead and understand you know how can we provide this care in other locations in other regions, uh, and and not only with the concept of you know uh, transferring patients, but how do we invest within that community? And I was very very fortunate to be able to you know lead such efforts, and now uh, Ann Arbor, which is in the uh, southern region, uh, the southeast uh, component of Michigan, we have been able to move into the west, uh, and we aided in the formation of a comprehensive stroke center, and that actually served as the foundation of the University of Michigan Health West, and we have done the same uh, in Traverse City. Uh, these are uh, geographically, uh, you know, you're looking at Grand Rapids, which is 150 miles away and Traverse City, which is probably on the order of 250 uh, miles away. So transferring stroke patients or those that require time-sensitive management is not ideal. And so, you know, it's, it's things that I saw uh, Dr. Vaz uh, be uh, leading, how to be able to collaborate, how to be able to push forward. And, and this uh, formed a significant component of my, you know, clinical leadership. Uh, at the beginning, there was an opportunity. I had seen something uh, be done, and and I tried to be able to utilize it in its own way uh, here at the University of Michigan. And then, you know, uh, Dr. Vez is going to remember, as well as Dr. Uh, ben Boxdale, uh, that I worked for six months. I was always, uh, you know, invested in science. And in fact, I would tell you, um, my dad's a mathematician. And uh, uh, I never thought I would go into medicine. Uh, I, I went in wanting to do engineering. And uh, the Howard Hughes Fellowship that Dr. Vest talked about uh, was a summer project that I wanted to get involved in and earn some money. And so we were building a human cytomegalovirus bioassay for immunocompromised patients. That was like, I believe that was my sophomore year. And uh, the idea that you could team up with two other people and create a bioassay that could influence the lives of so many uh, was extremely, extremely impactful and appealing to me. So science was always at the heart of, of one of the main reasons uh, of, of you know, going into medicine. And so I wanted to be able to continue that. And so you know, I, I worked in Dr. San Antonio's lab uh, the mentorship of uh, Dr. Vez and Dr. Van Boxdale and them. You're seeing here uh, endothelial cells. Our goal was, you know, could you utilize a coil uh, as a conduit to be able to transfer uh, biological tissue? And in this case, could you put endothelial cells into aneurysms so they would heal faster? And, and you see some of this. And, and guess, you know, one of the first projects he, I did here was instead of utilizing human umbilical vein endothelial cells, I used brain endothelial cells, and I wanted to compare it on different types of coils, how fast would they grow. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we used to work on uh, animal aneurysm models uh, back in my training, and uh, uh, we did the same here. As you can see, uh, these are coils, and the green represents live cells on the coils. The, uh, the red represents the dead cells. And so it just showcases to you that uh, we can take brain endothelial cells and, and, and allow them to be able to grow on coils. Uh, of course, it's extremely, extremely challenging. What do you do? You know, how do you uh, get it into the intravascular system without it thrombosing or causing an emboli? And then we were able to show uh, just you know, like I had learned uh, in training, except we worked in a rat aneurysm model, that when you put a GDC coil in, uh, you don't get as much scarring and tissue formation as you do with hydrogel uh, coils that you see on the right side here. And so uh, in essence, you know, the foundation of what you learn in the OR, outside of the OR, uh, in science, uh, and, and that formed a great foundation. So I can't you know, thank my mentors uh, you know, uh, Dr. Vez, uh, enough uh, for the foundation. So I want to be able to pivot and I want to be able to move to, uh, you know, the main topic of discussion, and that's intracerebral hemorrhage. I don't think uh, 
uh, I need to be able to tell this audience in terms of the incidence. Uh, but you know, the, the number to really look at is uh, 2 million patients with intracerebral hemorrhage worldwide. It's not a, uh, it's, it's, it, this incidence is, in, is not uh, small as we think of it potentially sometimes compared to ischemic stroke. Uh, and it's devastating, right? 40% mortality at one month with the best of what we have to offer. And so uh, there, is, there is so much potential uh, space here for innovation, for understanding of, of how, we are, how we can treat patients and, and to be able to achieve uh, better outcomes. So I want to start out with a case example and, and see if, you know, uh, you know, there would be some takers of what you would uh, think you would want to do with this young lady. Um, this is a 34-year-old woman. This was probably uh, two years into my practice. Uh, this was probably 2010, uh, I believe. 34-year-old woman uh, who's uptunded uh, in the postpartum period. Uh, she's got right-sided hemiplegia. She's aphasic. And, and, and she goes from being awake to uptunded over 24 hours. Like she, she's starting to posture. Um, would anybody offer her surgical treatment uh, uh, for this intracerebral hemorrhage or any sort of surgical therapy. I don't know if there are any, uh, Errol, I don't know if anybody is uh, uh, putting anything in the chat uh, or would you just medically manage uh, this patient? There's a mix. Okay. There's a, and, and rightly so uh, because uh, even today, I don't think we know uh, what exactly is the right decision. There may not be one right decision for this. And, and I'll tell you, I opted, uh, I saw someone who had a great exam with that volume hemorrhage. And as the edema grew, the mass effect grew. And so I took on the, you know, the notion that, guess what? At least I can take away the mass effect indirectly and see what happens. Uh, we came, you know, this was, I would say, uh, the decision was whether to withdraw support or to do everything humanly possible, meaning a hemicraniectomy. And at that time, I'll tell you, I don't think there was a right or a wrong uh, uh, decision. And so we did this, and, and this is what her scan uh, years later looks. Uh, this, you see this MRI, you see the encephalomalacia. A lot of times you do the hemicraniectomy, and unfortunately, the vein at the edge uh, gets compressed and you can end up with a small venous uh, infarct as well. Uh, so she did survive uh, because you're looking at this image. And, and I'll tell you, I was shocked. I was shocked at what we got. And, and the reason to present this case is not to be able to you know, build a practice out of uh, one example, but it's to be able to showcase that there's a lot that we don't understand. Uh, so at two years, she was ambulatory. Uh, she had dysarthria, but she could communicate. She was paretic on the right side, but she could walk. And she independently lives with her baby. And, and so, you know, the question becomes, is there a role for surgical intervention uh, in primary intracranial hemorrhage? We know that we got to take out the hemorrhages uh, when it's an ABM, when it's a cavernoma, uh, when it's a brain aneurysm with anteroparenchymal, when it's a hemorrhagic tumor, et cetera. But primary intracranial hemorrhage, the hypertensive, uh, that may be low bar, that may be uh, deep uh, basal ganglia or thalamic hemorrhages. And so the rest of the talk uh, looks at what's the current state and, and where, could we, where could we head? And so let me, you know, just starting out with, uh, there are a multitude of trials that have been done looking at how do we prevent re-expansion of hematomas? And so it is thought that uh, 20 to 30% of the time, uh, by the time that you see an intracerebral hemorrhage patient, their hematoma has already expanded. Uh, and, and the number one culprit, I would say uh, number one, number two, uh, are hypertension and the use of anticoagulants. And so how do you control that hypertension? And our, do trials showcase uh, that aggressive, aggressive control versus uh, a less aggressive control is, is any better. And so you look at these three randomized control trials, interact, interact to, attach to, 
and and I think you know uh, the the goals in all of this is to try to maintain systolic blood pressure less than 140 with attach uh, being quite aggressive. And and I think the take home message is a systolic blood pressure goal of 140 to 160 leads to same clinical outcome without significant hematoma expansion and without renal dysfunction. Uh, you worry about you know someone coming in at a systolic blood pressure of 220 they get down to 120, uh, that the autoregulation system within uh, the renal arteries uh, may not be good enough to be able to sustain that. They end up with renal uh, injury. So uh, most certainly control of hypertension is important, uh, and there's level one evidence uh, to be able to support this. I think aggressive control can be maintained, but aggressive control has not necessarily shown better clinical outcome, but you do see uh, less uh, expansion of the hematoma. Uh, how about, you know, we see the, our population is aging and the use of oral anticoagulants uh, is on the rise. And, and thus the incidence of intracranial hemorrhage uh, is also uh, on, on the rise. And so with that, uh, how do we reverse this? Uh, and, and the way to be able to uh, reverse this uh, is uh, to be able to utilize either FFP or PCC uh, and, and fresh frozen uh, plasma, or to be able to take, you know, factor two, seven, nine, and 10 and combine them and just give that. And, and the main difference being, you know, if, if you give FFP, you're giving a fair amount of, of volume to go with it. And, and the factors aren't as concentrated uh, as you would in PCC. And so you can see here, and this is, you know, uh, this is widely known. Uh, it's, a, it's a review for, for everybody. Uh, to, to be able to achieve INR less than 1.2 within three hours of therapy, if you give FFP, you can achieve that 9% of cases. If you give PCC, 67%. And then look at the mortality. Uh, if you can reverse any coagulation quicker, uh, then guess what? There's probably a lower incidence of rehemorrhage expansion, your ability to take them to the OR quickly. And so it, make, uh, it makes sense that the mortality would be lower as well. So the utilization of PCC uh, as opposed to FFP in reversal of anticoagulation. Now, uh, a lot of our patients, uh, as we talked about, uh, they have CAD, they have uh, peripheral artery disease, uh, they may have uh, had uh, uh, strokes in the past, et cetera. And so a lot of our, our patients are on antiplatelet agents. And so should we be reversing? Uh, should we be giving individuals platelet transfusion uh, when they come in with the ICH? And, and taking uh, away the population that you have to take to the OR. Uh, in that you know, case, I, I would say, you know, uh, absolutely, uh, I think we should consider giving platelet transfusion. Or someone that has already shown you re-expansion of the hematoma. Uh, while uh, and they have had a history of uh, antiplatelet use. So, uh, but platelet uh, transfusion in general, uh, prophylactically for ICH patients, has actually shown uh, that it leads to increased mortality. And so, uh, you know, platelet uh, transfusion with a purpose in terms of um, taking a patient to the OR uh, or the hematoma has expanded. Uh, makes a great deal of sense. Platelet transfusion prophylactically, uh, there's probably, while I, I would say there may not be harm, uh, its, its ability to lead to better outcomes is in question. Uh, and, and then, you know, what do we do with our patient population that needs to be anticoagulated? So they have atrial fibrillation uh, and they suffered a primary ICH. Uh, what do you do with that population? Uh, and then even uh, more complicating uh, for the need of anticoagulation are those with mechanical heart valves. And, and again, uh, you know, there's no right answer here. Uh, these are a series of, of studies put together to be able to uh, show a signal. And the signal is that probably waiting at least two weeks without anticoagulation is important if you're going to put a patient back on anticoagulation. In the context of AFib, uh, that's currently being studied, and, and we should have a better understanding of that in the, in the years uh, to come.
<clears throat> but when it comes to mechanical heart valves, uh, I think waiting at least two weeks, uh, the best studies show us that uh, re anticoagulating within two weeks leads to a high incidence of re hemorrhage. So, you know, that's the best uh, evidence we have for medical management uh, with respect to uh, manage the hypertension, reverse the anticoagulation, uh, and, and, and uh, reversal of platelet, any platelet use. Uh, only in certain circumstances. How about the surgical treatment? Uh, and the surgical treatment, you know, I would tell you just like with any trial in any discipline, including our thrombectomy trials, uh, you know, each trial gets you uh, a better understanding of the population that should be included in the next trial. Uh, and, and a lot of times it doesn't necessarily uh, show you the primary outcome difference that you're looking for, but you learn a lot. And, and be able to guide that the next trial should include the following patient population rather than the entirety of everyone who has ICH. And I think that's the story with uh, you know, the STITCH trials. Uh, as you can see here, and, and, and I think you know, I would, uh, most are aware, uh, STITCH, it did not show uh, improvement in good outcome of, of surgery versus medical management. And we'll talk about, uh, then a STITCH two trial was done uh, with the thought that if the hemorrhage is closer to the cortex, if it's done sooner, uh, that it could lead to better outcomes. And, you know, every study has its own set of problems. Uh, there are a large patient population that moved from the medical arm to the surgical arm. And so if, if you do an intend to treat analysis, you got a quarter of medical arm patients who actually got surgery, but they're being treated uh, within their their statistics are be, being treated as though they are within the medical arm. Uh, plus, if you look here, uh, ICH volume of 10 cc's, I don't know if I would want to take that out. So again, uh, this showed that, you know, the, the, there could be benefit for larger hematomas if you're able to get to them uh, sooner. And here are the results uh, for medical and surgical. But once again, I think we learned a lot about what should be done in the next trial rather than uh, showcasing an, an improvement. <clears throat> and so, uh, you know, the question becomes, uh, do we need to be able to change the paradigm of how we manage ICH? Uh, we think of medical management, of how to stabilize the patient. We think about surgical management, how to be able to evacuate the hematoma. And, and this case right here, uh, to me, you know, showcases that there may be a third aspect that needs to be involved. Uh, so take a look at uh, this hematoma here, a, a larger hematoma. Even when you get the hematoma out at day seven, look at the degree of edema, right? This is a primary ICH. This is not uh, a tumor. Look at the degree of edema. Uh, so, you know, we can remove the hematoma, but are there a subset of patients uh, where a, a biological process is already in effect. And if you remove the hematoma, you can remove the mass effect, but you're not going to necessarily uh, affect the secondary injuries uh, which are, are already taking place uh, and that domino effect has already uh, been initiated. And so the question becomes, uh, how can we utilize uh, our surgical tools, our craniotomy, smaller craniotomy, bore hole. Uh, how can we become as minimally invasive as possible to be able to evacuate hematomas with minimal manipulation of the brain? And I think uh, there are more and more trials that are being done uh, at this point. And I'll show you, you know, do you want to use an endoscope? What do you want to use to be able to evacuate these hematomas? And then why so much edema even after you evacuate? And is there, how do you fix that? Uh, I don't think doing a hemicraniectomy is the way. Is there, can we figure out, you know, why the edema happens and maybe give a, a medical therapy? Can we think about ICH like we think about a tumor? Uh, we evacuate, we take as much out as we can, and then patients get chemotherapeutics, they get radiation, they get adjuvant uh, type therapies. Uh, so, uh, you know, our Crosby Lab Center, which is the research arm of our department, uh, led by Gohashi uh, up at the top and Richard Keep at the bottom, uh, have spent about 20 years trying to understand 
uh, how does intracerebral hemorrhage in the brain lead to neuronal injury, edema, and hydrocephalus formation? And as you can see, you know, one of the earlier studies, this is a swine intracranial hemorrhage. And you can see uh, if you don't evacuate a hematoma, you lead to significant edema. If you evacuate it, that degree of edema goes down. Uh, and this is not, you know, edema that would be an uh, indirect measure of brain compression or shift associated with the just presence uh, of, of the mass effect. And so what's the culprit? And so if you look at swine ICH models, look at this swine intracerebral hemorrhage. And if you were to quantify the, the amount of iron that's being leached out of the hematoma and penetrating the brain, uh, here's, we're not even looking at uh, the, the uh, hematoma cavity where you'd expect tons of iron as the RBCs are lysing. But in the perihematoma region here, uh, you see the amount of hemosiderin deposition, right? And then even if you were to step out, you know, a centimeter, two centimeters away from where the hematoma is, uh, you see the hemosiderin deposits. And so all this iron that's being deposited in the brain after someone has a hemorrhage, uh, what are the consequences of that? And over years and years, what they have been able to showcase is, is iron leads to extensive neurotoxicity, leads to neuronal death, uh, leads to the prevention uh, of healing, uh, and is a culprit in, in hydrocephalus formation uh, once it gets within the CSF space. And, and how, you know, does that mean that if you chelate the iron somehow, if you could just uh, uh, give a medication that would bind the iron and neutralize it, that you could think make things better. Uh, and, and in animal models, that's absolutely true. Uh, what uh, we have been able to show uh, through Gohashi and Richard Keep's work is that if you take swine, here's a swine uh, at the bottom here, uh, uh, picture C. Uh, you see the ICH here? And you see the perihematoma damage that's taking place. And if you give defroxamine, look at the right-sided images, it's a clean hematoma cavity. And the perihematoma damage is almost all gone. And so uh, this is, you know, you can think of in one way as a chemotherapeutic uh, for intracerebral hemorrhage to prevent secondary injuries. Now, uh, is it as simple as saying, let's give all ICH patients defroxamine? Uh, and, and we're going to get better outcomes. Uh, I wish that were the case. Uh, here's uh, uh, the first defroxamine and in intracerebral hemorrhage trial uh, that was done out of the MGH group uh, and, and supported by Gohashi in, in our labs here, uh, showcased that if you give defroxamine, and this dosing was understood through the swine studies, if you give defroxamine through uh, uh, you know, for three days with ICH to see if you can neutralize the iron. Uh, the modified Rankin score uh, between control and, and defroxamine is, is no difference. But something really interesting happens. Uh, you know, we all know that ICH and subarachnoid hemorrhage patients, hemorrhagic stroke, they take longer to recuperate. And so uh, determining their outcome at, at Three months and saying that's end all and be, you know, uh, end all with respect to recovery uh, may not be accurate. They also looked at MRS at 180 days. This is MRS zero to two. And they saw a significant difference. Uh, this was a phase two trial, though, and it was not meant to be able to necessarily uh, show a significant difference uh, with, with power. Uh, but it's a signal. It's a signal that uh, at at 180 days, if you give defroxamine, uh, there's a higher probability of better outcomes. It needs to be studied uh, more. And in fact, we are, uh, we are running a pilot study of defroxamine and subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, where you know, with a hematoma, you can think about taking out the hematoma with subarachnoid hemorrhage. The iron and the RBCs uh, have been distributed throughout the CSF. And so we're trying to understand if, if defroxamine in that population could reduce hydrocephalus injury and, and vasospasm. So uh, it, 
we have, you know, the chemotherapeutic, the, the chemo agent that could prevent those secondary injuries. How do we build upon that and, and develop the most minimally invasive technique to be able to remove hematomas? And you see all the different techniques that are utilized. Uh, you got the NECO system, you have different, uh, you know, uh, retractors, uh, tubes that you can put in. You can use endoscopic technique, uh, you know, the Apollo system that exists. All of these uh, it, utilize, you know, at the end of the day, mechanical force to be able to disperse and, and they make a, you know, a, a, a small bore hole within the brain to be able to reach the clot. And the, and the question becomes, is there you know, anything more minimally invasive than this? And, and I would say probably the most minimally invasive technique, if a patient can tolerate, is, is the MISTI to date, uh, where you basically put a ventriculostomy catheter in the long axis of the clot, and uh, you put TPA. Uh, never would I have thought that I would be, you know, putting TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, something utilized for ischemic stroke inside a clot. Uh, but guess what? It does, it lyses the clot and it allows for evacuation of the clot. And as you can see here, uh, we participated in the MISD3 trial. Uh, here's a uh, left uh, frontal parietal type uh, intracranial hemorrhage. And we placed a ventriculostomy catheter. And within a few days, the hematoma is gone. Uh, with with uh, placement of a ventric and institution of TPA. Uh, now you you could this technique has has its own you know set of uh, flaws. Uh, it, it, the technique takes a long time. You institute a milligram of TPA uh, every eight hours, and then you've got to get CAT scans. You can't initiate the therapy unless the hematoma is stable, right? So you can't do this for every patient. It's not ideal. Uh, most of us want to be able to evacuate the hematoma so we don't uh, you know, initiate that process uh, of secondary injuries and iron leaching out as the RBCs are lysing. But uh, this MISTI trial was able to uh, show in a sub-analysis that if you remove greater than 75% of the clot, you had better clinical outcomes. So now you're starting to see this signal of a better patient selection and signals towards a better patient outcomes if we can do this in minimally invasive ways. And so, you know, what what I would what I would you know propose uh, and what we would love to be able to do, uh, and and you know the number of patients needed uh, and the cost is substantial, but for us all to have a you know conversation about. Uh, that ICH management involves uh, not only ICH evacuation with the most minimally invasive therapies, but also uh, defroxamine to be able to neutralize the iron neurotoxicity. And so uh, over the last uh, 10 years, uh, I have been working on the possibility of, is it possible to be able to do uh, ICH evacuation in real time uh, with it just uh, being, uh, being able uh, to liquefy the clot without ever making an incision. And all you got to do is put in a ventria and allow gravity to drain the clot. Uh, and, and that be done in maybe, you know, 20, 30, 40 minutes and that anybody could do it. And so you see the limitations of current, you know, techniques. Uh, the MISTI utilizes thrombolytics, mechanical evacuation. Guess what? Uh, you know, if you're going to utilize endoscopic, it's still mechanical force. You're you're pulling, you're prodding, um, and and that's a technical skill set that maybe not everybody has. Uh, uh, so it, there is a need for a, a very basic, uh, non-invasive, minimally invasive uh, technique. And so, how would this technique work? Uh, take for example. Uh, we would have some mechanism of lysing the clot without ever making an incision. And, and then you would utilize uh, image guidance to put a ventric and just drain it out. Uh, and then I'll showcase uh, to you that this concept could be utilized for brain tumors. It could be utilized for many diseases uh, with this type of technology. And so I was, uh, I was uh, you know, I opened up the 
a homepage for uh, for engineering and biomedical engineering, and I was looking through uh, what people were doing. I came upon Charles Kane, and Charles Kane, uh, and Jen Zhu, uh, who was a graduate student in in his laboratory. Uh, they had discovered uh, that if you fire microsecond pulses of ultrasound, and and if you could get those micro pulses to be able to uh, be additive. That is, they come together uh, at the same time at a focal point, uh, and you can reach uh, a, a sound wave uh, whose amplitude is greater than 26 megapascals. Uh, right at that meeting point, a two millimeter uh, bubble cloud uh, appears. And that two millimeter bubble cloud, uh, as it expands and collapses, it liquefies the two millimeters of tissue. So think of it. Uh, volumetric, uh, volumetrically as a, a two millimeter knife that can be applied anywhere without ever touching anything. And it can only appear if the threshold is reached, meaning there is no injury anywhere in between. Uh, you only get this knife uh, if the, the 26 megapascals is reached. And so these are uh, some histological samples that showcase to you. Here's that two millimeter of injury in 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 an in vivo mouse brain, you see the surrounding tissue looks okay, and that you're able to do this without ever making an incision, without ever drilling a hole in the skull. And so, how does this look? Uh, uh, a great deal, uh, you know, of of uh, tribute to Jen Zhu and Jonathan Sukovich, uh, as we have been working on this, as to how we develop this uh, for the brain. So. You're gonna. I'm gonna. I'll show you here. But you're gonna have a transducer to be able to reach that 26 megapascal threshold. You don't need one ultrasound probe. You're pro, You know. You need more than 300 probes aligned in a hemisphere that, as the sound waves come, they're gonna reach a certain focal distance. And the moment they reach that, uh, they're gonna form the two millimeter bubble cloud. And then you can change by turning on and off the ultrasound uh, as to where they meet uh, to be able to form that two millimeter bubble cloud to be able to treat the tissue. And so how's this look? Uh, this is the, uh, what, what uh, is, is the first, you know, uh, the world's first histotripsy array. Uh, you'll see more than uh, 300 ultrasound elements that are present. Each of these numbers uh, is a, these are ultrasound elements. Uh, they have emission and receive capability. Uh, so you can send off uh, all the, you know, the engineering behind this uh, is a tribute to our, our engineers, but you can uh, send off microsecond pulses of ultrasound waves from each. Uh, and at the focal distance, at the focal distance of this uh, hemisphere, right? Uh, they're going to meet, they're going to reach. Uh, this is non-radiation. It's non-thermal. The MR-guided focused ultrasound for essential tremor uh, relies on thermal energy. Uh, this is incisionless, and it's a true surgical ablation. You are making a cut. You are making, you are, it's your, it's your knife and sucker uh, trying to homogenize you know, tissue. Uh, so this array diameter is about 30 cm's, the focal distance where they all meet 15. And as you can imagine, uh, you could turn on and off uh, the ultrasound probes at different times so they meet at different locations. And so without ever moving this, you can steer the focal point by five centimeters in multiple directions. Uh, what does this allow you to do? You can treat large lesions, superficial, deep, anterior, posterior. Uh, so what does this look like? I hope this is gonna play. So what you will see here, and we'll play this a couple of times, is uh, initially what you're seeing is ultrasound waves coming and they're all gonna meet at a focal distance and out of it erupts. A, a bubble cloud. This is a high-speed camera. The bubble cloud is being formed in a water tank. Uh, and uh, as they come together, that bubble cloud is your knife. 
And it only appears if we can reach the threshold and it only appears in that two millimeter uh, region. And so uh, the first thing that we wanted to be able to showcase uh, was can we lice clot transcranially? And so if you look at this histotripsy array, this is our array. Uh, here's the human skull and here's clot inside uh, uh, this encasing. Uh, here's the MRI. So we can liquefy without ever touching this clot, without ever putting anything inside it, drilling a hole. We can liquefy 40 milliliters of clot in 30 minutes. Uh, and then you can put a needle and actually just allow it to drain. Uh, and, and so the next phase of studies was, is this safe? You know, can you do this? Uh, or are we causing extensive and, you know, injury that we're not recognizing? And so uh, we wanted to take this into the swine. And, and so we had control uh, swine where we would form the ICH. Those swine that we would form the ICH and, and treat it with histotripsy. Histotripsy is, is the name of this technology. Uh, and, and then those that I would treat the clot and see if I could drain it. And so uh, on day one, we would do a craniotomy on, on the uh, swine uh, skull. You may ask, well, why are you doing a craniotomy? The swine skull is too thick and it's flat. Uh, the human skull is, is uh, perfect because of its uh, you know, contour uh, for this type of technology. Plus, we wanted to be able to see with the ultrasound in real time uh, what kind of lesion we were making, uh, what kind of injury we were causing. Uh, so you form the clot, you allow the animals to recuperate, then you treat with histotripsy and survive them for a week when you do MRI and, and do histological analysis uh, post-euthanasia. And so here's the ultrasound images. Here's swine uh, brain, untreated clot. Here's our ability to liquefy the clot, the center of the clot, leaving the periphery intact, right? You would think in a patient, that's where the bleeding point is. And here we can put a needle, right, up to this point, there's no penetration of the brain. This is all done in a incisionless manner. Now you can put a needle and suck out the clot that you have uh, liquefied. And here's what it looks like. Uh, in, so here's the, sorry about the movement. Here's the ICH. And within the ICH, you're gonna see uh, the, the flash of the bubble cloud, that flash uh, is that two millimeter, two and a half millimeter bubble cloud liquefying, homogenizing the tissue. And so what does this look like? If you do acute studies, uh, here's the swine ICH, here's the histology showing you the, the solid clot. Once we liquefy it with our histotripsy, uh, you can see the liquefaction of the clot and you can see uh, histologically the part of the clot that has been left alone. And you can see the same thing on MRI here. Uh, take a look, control animals. These are swine where we formed the ICH, you know, didn't do anything to it. Uh, the middle row here is formed the ICH and treated it. And, and the bottom row is treated it and drained it. And you can see how you can treat this clot uh, and drain it in a swine model, not causing, uh, you know, you look at all these flare signal and T2, uh, you're not seeing it. Uh, so it appears uh, to be safe. And here is histology to be able to showcase to you uh, the control. This is the solid clot, the ability to liquefy it, and the ability to drain it. Now remember, you know, these are swine animals. These are not large clots. Uh, but we are showcasing uh, safety and, and volumetrically the idea uh, that you can liquefy and, and remove this clot. As you can imagine, uh, this technology is not necessarily just for ICH. Uh, all of our work initially started in ICH, but we have moved forward now. And I'm gonna showcase to you here that uh, this is a human cadaveric brain. Uh, we haven't made a single incision, a single hole in the skull. Here's a uh, septostomy. 
that you see here, uh, where we can guide the bubble cloud and make a hole in the septum pellucidum without ever touching the brain. Uh, you see this thalam, you know, uh, this thalamic lesion. We have created a uh, a square lesion within the thalamus, and so you know what could be done. Uh, you could do endoscopic third ventriculostomy with this, without you know, instead of uh, putting a probe, uh, drilling a bar hole, uh, putting a catheter, ballooning, cutting, etc. Uh, you define the area that you want a two millimeter, three millimeter, five millimeter hole, and proceed. You could do a septostomy. You could potentially do a corpus callosotomy. You could, uh, uh, you could, uh, you know, a pituitary tumor uh, could potentially uh, be removed. Uh, we have moved on, and we are testing it now uh, for ablating glioma tissue in in mice. And you can see here uh, what we our initial studies show that you can uh, uh, kill the tissue and open the local blood brain barrier. Uh, and so we're doing combination uh, studies to, to really understand, uh, it, could this be utilized for, for brain tumors? Uh, we're testing it for, let's say you have a large skull-based meningioma that's hard, fibrous. Could you liquefy it, drain the center, collapse it down, and, and to be able to work uh, in a much better, much safer uh, environment. So uh, we, we are pursuing multiple avenues. Uh, I think the goal is to be able to get this uh, in testing in a phase one, phase two uh, trial, uh, probably for ICH evacuation uh, within the next two to three years. At this point, uh, the, the majority of the work is being done in terms of how do you operationalize this? Uh, how do you make it easy? Do you, can you do this in the neuro ICU? Uh, this histotripsy array, think of it as a small CT scan uh, that's portable, can be moved. Uh, and we are at this time working on fusing it with image guidance that neurosurgeons utilize on a daily basis. So you can guide and draw the volume that you want liquefied and, and then proceed and liquefy it and then utilize the same stealth to be able to drain that tissue, whether it's uh, uh, ICH tissue that's been liquefied or brain tumor or whatever uh, it may be. So, you know, none of this work uh, would be possible without tremendous effort from so many people. Uh, and I, I can't thank these team members into, you know, enough. Uh, uh, Jen Zhu here that you see on the, on the left is, is, is brilliant. And uh, I'm so lucky to be able to work uh, with her and Jonathan Sukovich that you see who started out uh, as a postdoc and has stayed on as faculty as well as numerous engineers and, and graduate students. So uh, with that, you know, I can't thank you enough. Uh, I wish I were there in person uh, to be able to interact. Uh, it's tough interacting on a virtual setting, but uh, I feel, you know, privileged uh, to have had some time to be able to share these ideas and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Aditya, that was fantastic. Uh, really uh, blown away, actually. This is so incredible what you, you brought this to. Um, there are a bunch of questions that uh, we definitely want to go over. Um, so one of the things is uh, definitely getting you back here in person. So one of the questions, um, have, you, uh, have any of the minimally invasive clot retrieval uh, trials changed your management of ICH? So based on, you know, stitch, everything else, have you changed right. your practice? I, I would say, you know, uh, even though MISTI, MISTI didn't meet the primary uh, endpoint, the sub-analysis showed some benefit. So I don't do MISTI. There are people out there who, who actually will do MISTI technique. Uh, we, uh, I wouldn't say it has, I think I'm more optimistic that there is a surgical there's a partial surgical solution to primary ICH, uh, but I wouldn't say I'm going after basal ganglia hemorrhages today because of any of the trials. Uh, I think is a day, you know, if I could utilize this, this tool to be able to liquefy the center, uh, you know, 70, 80% of a basal ganglia hemorrhage and put a ventric and just suction it out, would I do it? I think I, think I would do it in a trial form and see uh, if we can, you know, improve outcomes and reduce uh, ICU length of stay. 
Uh, and for all the um, participants, uh, please go to the Q&A uh, to add. I see some people have hands up. And if you go to the Q&A, uh, we can get your questions answered. Um, another question is, do you manage ICH differently if there's even a suspicion of amyloid angiopathy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would be uh, more reluctant to be able to evacuate the hematoma. I think the recurrence of those ICHs is so high. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I think context matters. If you have a patient who's neurologically who has done well, it's a, uh, you know, majority of that amyloid hemorrhage uh, is, is within one space rather than over, you know, multitude of gyri. Uh, if you have, and it's causing a mass effect, I would go after it. Got it. Okay. Um, another question is, so what, what is the, um, what are the roadblocks right now? Or I guess I think a better thing is delay into getting into first and man, given, first of all, your, 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 um, preclinical data is pretty, pretty great. Um, the fact that uh, um, histotripsy has been used in other things within the human body. Um, what are the biggest hurdles right now to getting this first in human? Yeah, I, that's a great question. I think, uh, so histotripsy, you know, the technology has been utilized within liver cancer, right? right? And uh, uh, there is, uh, they just finished, finished up their analysis and I believe they have submitted you know, the same, our, our IP is licensed to the same, you know, uh, company that, uh, you know, put forth that trial. Uh, with multiple centers. So uh, that is submitted to the FDA. I think the toughest challenge and which has taken us years and years, right? In the abdomen, you can utilize ultrasound to guide where your therapy is. With the brain, with that skull, it just makes it so challenging. Number one, 70 to 80% of your energy is dissipated in the skull. And so that's why you need uh, you know, over 300 elements to get enough energy to form the bubble clap. Uh, second is the skull prevents us from visualizing uh, the underlying tissues uh, with the just ultrasound. So now we have to marry and fuse this technology to image guidance. Uh, and the the third I would say is we're still so you know one of the videos that I showed you saw the 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 sound waves coming and you saw the bubble cloud forming. And, and the bubble cloud actually, sh you know, as it uh, collapses and expands, it sh sends off shock waves. And, and these, these ultrasound probes actually have receiver capability. And so the shock wave emitted in homogenized tissue versus, uh, you know, non-homogenized tissue, the signature of that is different. And so the engineering team is trying to build for us to be able to, you know, utilize those receive properties to be able to understand when are we done treating, right? Uh, not only that, we're studying, uh, so you could utilize, let's say you misfire this and you hit the middle cerebral artery or you hit a cranial nerve. What we're finding is uh, that you can be, you, you need so many pulses, so many bubble clouds to form at one time to be able to homogenize tissue. And you can, by, by setting the, how many pulses are gonna be given out, you can create tissue selection. So the, all those studies are being done. And, and you know, how do you get the patient into this? Uh, it does require, you know, you gotta have water around the skull, you know, for this to work uh, effectively. Uh, so I, I think you're looking at about two to three years. We're looking at two to three years. Got it. And I'm going to go, because there's a lot of questions here that I want to get answered. Um, so uh, what do you, uh, and I think it's probably be hard to answer, but at this point, what do you guys estimate, or maybe Medtronic estimate the cost of this uh, array would be? I think it would probably tough question to answer. I don't even know if I, if I should, you know, venture uh, because <laughs> it's like, Hey, you said uh, this. Why are you charging yeah. twice as much? You know, yeah, uh, I, think I think it's probably you're looking at a. It's got to be. I'm guessing probably one to two million dollars for the actual. Okay, got it. Yeah, for for the device. Now the the goal would be that you're getting that the device would lead. ICH is not. It would be like septostomy, ETV. Uh, it 
one device with multi-purpose. Right, right. Um, and then here's kind of a dual. When do you feel comfortable starting DOAX after or antiplatelets after ICH? Uh, it, depending upon the situation, I would say, uh, it, so if it was just a primary ICH patient and they were taking something for prophylaxis, I'd probably wait four to six weeks, make sure that I hadn't missed underlying vascular pathology. Uh, if it's uh, the, uh, you know, the heart valve, mechanical heart valve, uh, probably at least two weeks. Got it. And then uh, Lovenox or heparin? <laughs> I like heparin. <laughs> we all here like heparin. For right. some, you know, I can't pull up the studies, but uh, we utilize heparin sub-Q in our department and everybody else utilizes Lovenox. Yeah, it's interesting. We, we, we do the same and we certainly fight for it with our trauma colleagues. Right. I think that probably goes way back to when you and I were pups and, you know, seeing yeah. thousands and thousands of those patients. Um, yeah, interesting. Uh, do you think performing a burr hole and trying to use ultrasound through it will be more efficient than trying to go through the skull, especially if you're planning to do some sort of ventriculostomy or drainage to access the hematoma in a fashion? Basically, do you think it'll be more, you know, to go through a, a craniectomy or a burr hole? Yeah, I think uh, you wouldn't be, so you need that entire array and to be able to have the ultrasound waves coming from multiple directions. Uh, your your burr hole would not be large enough to be able to uh, create the bubble cloud. Got it. And then just the last question to close with this. Um, wh what are your thoughts on why um, the devices thus far, uh, uh, I think it's safe to say have failed. Um, you know, Penumbra's pretty much given up on Apollo. They're yeah. going, actually, we, we, we helped design something with image guidance and um, uh, a visualization all in one hand held, but what, what's your, what are your thoughts on why it really hasn't taken off? Even though I think everybody believes in the concept. I think, you know, I think it touches upon, first of all, it's a, uh, such a complex question, but I think it touches upon, you know, you saw that image and you and I uh, have seen these pictures where you do a beautiful evacuation of a hematoma and the patient doesn't do well, and the edema is still there. I would tell you, I really think that we should think about combination therapy. I, I, I really think evacuate the hematoma, give the defroximine and, and evaluate the outcomes. The other thing, you know, I would say from a societal perspective, uh, yes, we want, you know, clinical outcomes to get better. But from a societal perspective, if a family decides that they want everything done uh, and you evacuate the hematoma and you reduce the length of stay, by 50%. I think you have saved cost and there's something to be said for that. Uh, especially in today's day and age uh, where, where you know, resources uh, are, are not there. So um, I, I would say, I, I think let's think about combination therapy and more and more minimally invasive tools. I, I like the idea of, you know, uh, liquefying, and just a ventricular drainage. And I think Apollo is similar, except for the fact that you have, you know, semi-cutting suction, uh, you know, tool at the end of it. Yeah, no, it's a good thing. And, and, and I think, um, you know, one of the, the last things that I would say, and for this, which there, you know, we're all excited and, and you can sign us up as your first site, mm -hmm. we're, uh, we'd be excited to use it, is uh, I think one of the, and this is just my personal opinion that, there, it's too restricted in its use. These are tools that should be given to every neurosurgeon that does cranial work, um, not just the vascular subset, because I think one of the problems, I think you're exactly right, and that was the whole goal is in the beginning, just to reduce length of stay, get patients to rehab quicker, um, and then look at long-term outcomes. But it's such a small subset of people that are using it, we're never going to get to that end. And, you know, this is a device and anybody that knows how to do a burr hole or does clot evacuation when they're on trauma call should really have as a tool, not just vascular neurosurgeons. Um, but that's absolutely know, right. Yeah. Anyway, food for thought. So uh, multiple things here on what a great talk it was. So thank you so much. Uh, it was wonderful seeing you as always. And uh, we really appreciate it. Great talk. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks so everyone. much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye.